Thank you so much for joining us for this. My pleasure. You have asked recently President, former President Trump to re-endorse you. Two questions. Number one, can you win without that endorsement? And if the answer to that is yes, then why would you go back to him? The answer is yes, because you want a bigger margin. So that's that's simple. You simple think as that, that you would, but you think you can win without him. In well, we have been you. winning, um, as, as you may recall. We've gained about 20, 25 points in the polls over the two months preceding May 24th. We continue to be on the upswing. Of course, it's all going to depend on what the voters want to do on June 21st. Uh, let's be real clear. This is now a battle of turnout. Mm -hmm. If our voters uh, turn out 100 percent, then we win in a landslide. If her voters turn out 100 percent, then she wins in a landslide. So it's all about who gets to the polls on June 21st. You have not yet testified before the January 6th committee. Can you tell us what your position is on that now? Sure. Well, first, I haven't been subpoenaed. You That's still haven't thing. been subpoenaed? No. Part of the subpoena process is someone has to deliver you a piece of paper that says, be here. Here are the terms and conditions. You're an attorney. You for would whatever, know that. For whatever reason, they've declined to uh, adhere to their duties and responsibilities to serve that subpoena uh, on me. And it's not like I've been hiding out. I've been running all over the state of Alabama in a very public way. So I'm somewhat baffled. Uh, that having been said, I've got terms and conditions in which I probably would agree uh, to participate. Number one, it has to be public. No more of these clandestine secret uh, meetings or conferences or interviews where they leak what they want to leak out and the public doesn't get the whole picture. Okay. Make it public. This is the public's business. Number two, if they're going to require a fellow congressman to take up the time to submit to all this stuff, then by golly, it needs to be another congressman that participates in the questioning. If it's important enough for this congressman to be there, then it should be important enough for the other congressman to be there, and they should be the ones doing the questioning. Number three, it needs to be limited to events surrounding January the 6th of uh, 2020, mm -hmm. those events. And then finally, it would be nice, since it's been about a year and a half since all this stuff happened, if they would show me the documents they want to question me about so I could refresh my recollection a little bit rather than being blindsided. But if they meet those four basic requirements, and there used to be another one, that is you can't interfere with a Senate race, that one's kind of behind us now. Uh, but if they'd meet those four basic requirements, I'd be inclined to go ahead and participate. All right. We appreciate that answer. Prior to this primary, your opponent was highly critical of another candidate who refused to debate. At that time, you said you were more than willing to debate. You say you're willing to debate now. If that were to be able to happen, which it appears unlikely now, but if it were to be able to happen, what would a debate reveal to voters about you? About me? Mm -hmm. That I am a fighter. And I don't cater much to people who are dishonest. And in my judgment, Katie Britt's campaign has been one of the most brazenly dishonest campaigns I have seen in my years in public service, bar none. It's so bad that Mike Durant, who came in third, called her corrupt. Um, I don't What's go. What's the most dishonest part about her campaign, in your opinion? Well, just about everything she says in her attack ads against me, and Mike Durant feels the same way, apparently, about the attack ads against him. By way of example, Katie Britt's got this flyer attack ad. I can't keep track of which one are aired and which one are in these flyers that people are getting bombarded with. It says, look at all this money Mo Brooks has made off the federal government. We well, you know what that was? It's all salary, okay? Same salary she would get. That seems somewhat hypocritical to, hypocritical to me. Another one of the more recent barrages is Mo Brooks has um, supported tax increases, property taxes, income taxes, sales taxes. That's all hooey. It's 100% bovine excrement. I have not ever supported with a vote a property tax increase, never voted for one of those. I have never voted for an income tax increase, and I have never voted for a sales tax increase. Yet they put that out there as if it was the gospel, but really what they're doing is they're deceiving the American people, the people of the state of Alabama, because that is my greatest strength. I was ranked number one, according to the Alabama Taxpayers Defense Fund in the fight against higher taxes as a legislator. I helped lead the fight against Bob Riley's billion dollar tax increase in 2003. I participated in the statewide debates on the anti-tax increase side mm -hmm. of that debate. I voted for uh, Donald Trump's big tax cuts in, in December of 2017. I've got a really good anti-tax record, so it's a strength of mine in contrast to Katie Britt, who has publicly supported more tax increases than any other Republican in Alabama history. I so they not, have to cover up that, and the way they cover up is they lie. I have not yet heard, and I may have missed it, I have not yet heard any of your 
I would call them new ads, that would be running here leading up to the runoff. Are those going to start anytime soon? Well, I am not the special interest group candidate, so I'm not flush with millions and millions of dollars of cash. I'm the conservative candidate in this race and arguably the only Republican in this race. As you've seen, the Democrats have started endorsing Katie Britt as their Democrat nominee in the Republican runoff. And I'm sure you're familiar with what's percolated in that regard over the last uh, couple of weeks. So people who support me are Joe and Jane Citizen, regular folks. And they don't have the ability to compete with special interests who are investing in a candidate because they want a return on that investment, which means putting special interests above the interests of the American people. All right, let's talk about some of the key issues that we have all heard in the past few months. The nation is reeling from uh, what happened in Uvalde, Texas, from what happened in New York, from what happened in Chattanooga and Philadelphia. We're talking about mass shootings. Congress, a group at least of bipartisan uh, members of the Senate right now, are trying to come to some kind of a term that they could agree on for gun reform. If you were in the Senate right now, would you be willing to be a member of that bipartisan group? Look, the cause of this is the decline in moral values. We've got forces that promote amoral values rather than moral values, and the amoral values have been winning in the United States of America for decades. If people but have would respect, you be willing let me to let be me finish. I'm going to. I try to fix the problem. Okay, and the okay. problem is the decline in moral values. By way of example, when I was a kid. 16, 17, 18 year old, I'd bring a shotgun to school. I'd have it in the trunk of my car. I'd take off my- That uh, wouldn't happen today. No, I'd take off my chest waders because I'd just been duck hunting. And we didn't have these mass shootings. Why? Because we had stronger moral values. People were taught the value of life. People were taught thou shalt not kill. People were taught the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want to fix these problems, then go to moral values. And I should add too, that do you know what the number one weapon was used in the biggest mass killing in a school in the United States history? It wasn't a gun, it was a bomb. bomb. Okay, in Bath, Michigan. So we need to look at all of these issues and, but and that's quickly, the way to approach would, it. Would you be well, a, a member of that committee? It is ineffectual what okay. they're talking about. That's Here's why it's asking. ineffectual. Say in the state of Alabama, if someone is a danger to himself or to others and is not thinking straight upstairs, mm -hmm. you don't have to take their guns. You can take them. You can commit them. That's already yeah. the law. So if you're able to prove that someone is a danger to themselves or to others, then have them committed and that protects the entire state of Alabama from that person's desire to do evil things. We've got just so, a couple of ahead. minutes left. I'm sorry, I'd like to, to move That's along right. here. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court, any day now, may come out with a ruling that many believe will do away with Roe v. Wade. Is there any compromise, any compromise that you would see that would allow you to support Congress codifying the rights and privileges that a woman has right now? Or I, I, does all of it need to be I am pro-life. Yes. And I believe in protecting the life of the unborn child. That unborn child also has rights in my mind as evidenced by any number of criminal statutes out there where if you kill that unborn child now, if a criminal mm -hmm. does it, third party, then it's a criminal offense, right. okay? And that's where I am. I am pro-life and I want to protect all life. And to me, that is the best way to resolve it. Now, I happen to be in Congress, and we'll see what the Supreme Court does, but mm -hmm. to me, the best way to resolve this issue is pursuant to the Ninth and Tenth Amendments of the United States Constitution. It is a state's rights issue, and each legislature should decide what the appropriate response is if the Supreme Court follows the Constitution and overturns Roe v. Wade. And so we'll see what the state of Alabama legislature does in that vein, along with the other 49, 49 legislatures states. around the country. All right. Congress restored earmarks to the federal budget, and those earmarks, of course, would allow taxpayer dollars to be designated to specific projects in that lawmaker's district. The man you hope to replace, Richard Shelby, earmarked $551 million to Alabama, more than any other senator. What's your reaction? What's your belief about earmarking? Well, I oppose earmarking, and this is why. It is used to purchase corrupt public policy. It is used to buy congressmen and senators' votes in exchange for casting bad votes on other issues. That's part of it. The other side of the coin is we have racked up a $30 trillion debt as a result of this earmarking process and buying those bad votes. Your share is about $90,000. Can you pay up? I can't. We sorry. could use it. Just we write us a check. <laughs> okay. Well, every man, woman, and child in America right now owes $90,000 because of irresponsible spending that is encouraged by 
the buying of votes through this earmark process. We need a better system that allows people and encourages people to vote based on the merits rather than how much money they can bring or how many buildings they can have named after them. Interesting. We have about a minute left. You're considered the underdog in this race. If you lose, you're going to be out of Washington. You won't have a job. You've been called a career politician. So what would you do if politics isn't in your future? I'm going to be the best grandfather I can be to 13 wonderful grandchildren. So you got a bunch and of them. And I'm going to be the best husband I can be to a wife who's been very tolerant of me with this public service. And I'm going to be the best father I can be to four wonderful adult kids and four wonderful adult kids-in-law. So you'll be fine either oh, way. I'll be taking them whitewater uh, canoeing and rafting <laughs> in the Smokies and maybe on the Locust Fork of the Black Warrior, Mulberry Fork of the Black Warrior. I'll be taking them out to the lake and I'll be baiting those hooks with time. crickets and worms and we'll see what we can catch. Final question then. Hindsight's always 20-20. Did you do the right thing in running for the U.S. Senate when you were pretty much assured that you would go back to Congress? Well, I believe in term limits. So as a legislator, I voluntarily term limited myself. I was not beat. As a county commissioner, I voluntarily term limited myself. I was not beat. As a congressman, I've served 12 years. I think that is about the appropriate time that a congressman should serve in the House of Representatives. And how long it, would you serve in the Senate if oh, you were elected? Well, I don't know. That would be up to the people of the United States of America generally and the people of the state of Alabama specifically. But my history has been about 12 years. About 12 years? Because I believe in term limits. That's what I do. But keep in mind that with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the history was eight years. But because we were about to embark into World War II, he thought it best to disregard the history as established by George Washington and, and serve on. throughout mm -hmm. uh, World War II because of the critical nature of that particular junction in American history. So I can tell you what my past has been, which ought to give you an indicator of what I'm going to do in the future, All right. but I don't want to close any doors. Sounds like a fair, fair assessment. Mo Brooks, a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for coming by. Pleasure's mine. I enjoyed it. All right.